Hi there. Today we're going to talk about data analysis. First, I want you to think about this statement, that data collection is only valuable if it influences the behavior of the therapist. And what does this statement mean to you? There's many times that we forget that we're taking data for a purpose. No, we're not just taking it so that we have stacks of paper or because it's a requirement or because it looks pretty, but our data has to have a purpose. And the purpose of that data is to guide us, to guide the therapist or the supervisor or consultant uh, in making changes based on that data. So beginning back at square one, we have to review what the independent and dependent variables are. Now these are two things I used to always get mixed up. Uh, an easy way to remember this is I for independent, I for intervention. So the independent variable is basically the intervention and the dependent variable is the outcome that you're hoping for. That's the change in behavior. And as you're going through and collecting data, what you're really trying to do is demonstrate that functional relationship between your interventions and the procedures that you've implemented and a change in the behavior. So you really want the data to show that this behavior change procedure is really the reason for behavior change. And the data also tell you whether or not your intervention is working. Is behavior change going in the direction you want? Your data will lead your interventions. And I, I love these three quotes. Uh, the organism is always right by Skinner. And I think he said in one of his books that the rat does what the rat does when he was working with rats. And the idea behind that is, you know, the child or client, whoever you're working with, they're going to behave in a way that the environment sets up for them to behave. So they are correct. If they're not progressing, it's not the child's fault. You know, there's something with the intervention that needs changed. So you have to let the data guide you. Ogden Lindsley phrased it a little differently, saying the student is always right. And uh, my wonderful first consultant I ever had really brought this home to me by telling me, if the student doesn't make progress, you're doing something wrong. And at first, I was a little put off by that comment because I was young and new in the field and thought that, well, if things didn't work, it must be the student just can't learn. But then his comment really hit home, and it made me realize that yeah, if we're not making progress, we've got to change interventions. And the only way to really tell if we're making true progress is through the data. Now here's a little bit more of a quick overview, which was covered in fall and also should have been covered in your coursework already. So first, when we talk about a behavior objective, behavior objectives need to be objective. They need to be clear and concise. And the four components of a good behavior objective, first you have to identify the student. Who is expected to do this behavior? Then you identify the condition or the antecedent. You know, what are the environmental factors that are going to lead up to this behavior? You have to provide a topography of the behavior itself, so a nice description of the behavior. That's also objective. And you have to have a criteria for meeting the objective. How do I know when this behavior objective is met and we can be done with it? How do I know that we're making progress? Now, these components, the student condition, behavior, and criteria, don't necessarily need to be in that order, but they do need to be present. Data forms. Once you have your objective, you've got to be able to take data on it. So you have to have a form that links directly to the objective. If your behavior objective 
is measuring progress in percentages, your data form needs to reflect percentages. If your behavior objective is reflecting frequency or a specific number, your data needs to reflect that because your data form is going to tell you the story of what's going on during intervention. And then finally we have a graph or if you're using a standard acceleration chart you'll have a chart uh, and this also needs to be directly related to the data form. So if your objective is measuring percentages, your data is measuring percentages, guess what? Your graph has to measure percentages. So you should have 0 to 100 percent, the full range. If your behavior objective is just measuring a specific number, say increase to 10 occurrences, your data form has to reflect that and your graph will also reflect that. So when we get into data analysis, we're going to discuss a quick review of raw data, line graph, bar graph, standard acceleration chart. And what I want you to think about is what are the pros and cons of each? So if any of you have used a bar graph or pie chart before, what are the pros and cons that you've experienced with that? For those of you that have used line graphs before, why do you use them? What's the pros and cons? And for those that have had the experience with a standard acceleration chart, what are the pros and cons of that? And I'd prefer if you pause a minute and just think this through a little bit uh, so you kind of have an idea of where you're coming from and you're thinking about these ahead of time. All right, so let's drop back a little bit and figure out why we even graph data. Graphing our data allows for visual introspection. It allows us to quickly look at it and see if there's a change. For example, I was working in a school once and I asked if you know, the teacher had some data on the student's behaviors. Uh, she said, sure, just a second. Ended up coming to me with three binders full of raw data. That's not usable. There's no way realistically for me to look through that and determine if the procedures have been effective, uh, if the behavior is really increasing or decreasing, and obviously there was no way for the classroom staff to make database decisions. So the books were handed back and I did let them know that I would review it when it's all graphed. When people have to graph data, there's also accountability. Because on the graph, instead of having a hundred different pages uh, to look through of raw data, you just have one graph. And it's really easy to identify, identify when there's missed sessions, when data wasn't taken, uh, different fluctuations in the behavior, the trends in the behavior. Visually, you can pick this out quickly on most graphs. So the graph itself holds people accountable because they know that, you know, okay, if I lose one data sheet out of a hundred, who's going to notice? But it is going to be noticeable when that day is missing on a graph. And also with the data, as we've mentioned, it's there to provide a way for you to make decisions. And you make those decisions based on the trend of the data. Now, is the behavior going in the direction we want it to go? Do we need to change anything to get it going in that direction? So a graph is extremely important. No BCBA should be working with data and not graphing it. If you're collecting, if you have a behavior objective, you have to have a data form. If you have a data form, you have to have a graph for that data form. Otherwise, there's no sense taking the data. So now, do we want to use a line or bar graph? In most cases, we're going to use line graphs because we're looking at change over time. And we're looking at the same behavior over time. 
So those two components are very important with a line graph. It's the same behavior and it's change over time. And line graphs are used to analyze a specific behavior over time. Now bar graphs are more descriptive. They compare. So if I'm comparing Sally's frequency of bathroom breaks to Jimmy's frequency of bathroom breaks, I would use a bar graph. But if I was trying to reduce Sally's bathroom breaks, number of bathroom breaks, over the course of a week, I would use a line graph. Some things to remember. Everyone's got to agree on the definition of the behavior and measurement. And again, this is why it's so important to have a very clear behavior objective, because it all starts there. When you have that clear behavior objective, the behavior is very obvious. Everyone can agree on it, agree on the topography. And when you give the criterion, everyone can agree on how to measure it. As you're moving forward to implement an intervention, you also have to think ahead. Sometimes interventions don't just work completely on their own. You have to think about why would this work? What reinforcement system do I have in place? So here's some examples. We have a line graph, and this is showing percent correct tax. And you can see down here we have the days, which might be the sessions, or however you want to divvy that out. When you're using percent, you have to show the whole range. So it goes from 0 to 100. You do not want to do a percent graph and only have your axis go up to 50 because that's not the full range. So we have to think about this. What path is the data going along? So if your data path is level, the general path of the data does it increase or decrease? It's kind of flatlined. The trend in relating to the data path tells you the direction of the data. Is it increasing or decreasing? And when we talk about the stability of a data path, uh, we're talking about how grouped are the data points. Are they all over the place, or are they nicely grouped and following a steady trend or at least remaining level? If your data is all over the place, it's most likely because your behavior objective is confusing or you're looking at too much. So you need to be more specific. There's an example of a level data path. Here's examples of looking at the level. So you see on the left side versus the right side, even though the data itself, the variability of the data, does not seem to be changed very much, there has been a level change. So depending on what you're looking for in your objective, this could be good. This could be progress. When you're doing your projects, you do want to look at level changes. The trend is the general direction of the data path, and you see this is an upwards trend. And here's an example of stability or bounce, depending on what term you want to use. And you can see this data path has a lot of bounce. It's very unstable. Again, there's an example of some variability. We can see the trend of the overall data, which looks good, 
the behavior is increasing, which may be what we want. But there's a wide range of bounce, of instability, of variability. So this tells me that even though we're going in the right direction, uh, I need to clean things up. There's either an environmental contingency that's affecting the data, or I don't have a clean enough objective, or my data forms are not telling me what I need to know. So when I see this consistently, that tells me I need to go back and clean something up. Now, phase lines, they're the vertical lines that come straight down, and you put those in to indicate some kind of change, that something happened that may change the data. So, for example, when you go from baseline to intervention, and that's when you hope the data changes, when you start intervention. Uh, when you change interventions, because you want to see if the change in the intervention has had any influence on the behavior. And you can also use phase lines for major events that occur that could affect the data. For example, a death in the family may affect the data, uh, therapist changes, things like that, change in school, uh, you know, different things like that that are major life events that could have an effect on the data. And just by adding a phase change line, that gives you a heads up to watch this to see if this major life change did affect progress. So there's an example of a phase change line between baseline and practice. And I know these graphs are pretty basic. I just wanted to do this so that you could uh, get the basic idea. So we briefly mentioned baseline data, but let's look at baseline data a little bit more. Baseline is when no intervention has been implemented. So it tells you what's going on before I do my wonderful intervention. Generally, you want a stable baseline prior to starting interventions, except when you're dealing with aggression, destructive behaviors, if these are increasing, you can start your intervention right away. If the trend in the baseline is going the direction you want the behavior to go in, then you don't need an intervention. Things are already getting better. If the trend is flat or level, or the behavior is getting worse, so you have a descending trend, or an ascending trend, whichever way you want your data to go, now you need to implement procedures. If the baseline is really unstable, you need to narrow your definition and the behavior objective. Again, when we see that instability with our data points, it means perhaps we're not being clear enough with what we're looking at, or maybe we're looking at too much, and we're looking at a package of behaviors instead of some very specific behaviors. So when we see that instability, we really need to weed out all these other variables that might be interfering. And it's good form to have at least five baseline data points. Rule of thumb in the past has been three, but recent research is really supporting five baseline data points. So please, with whatever you do, try to move towards that five baseline data points. It gives you a, a little more of a solid foundation to start your intervention from. All right, so we got a baseline quiz. Da, 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 da. So what do you do if the baseline is unstable? You should have said B. You need to redefine the behavior. All right, if the baseline trend is going in the direction you want, then you don't need to start intervention. You should have said C, because things are going well. If the baseline trend is going in an opposite direction than what you want,
A. This is a good time to begin treatment because things are going from bad to worse. And if the baseline is flat, again, A, we can begin treatment. Now let's talk about aim lines. Not everybody uses aim lines. I am a big fan of aim lines because I think that's what really helps guide you. So when you're doing your projects and writing data, at least while you're under my supervision, please use aim lines. With IEPs and treatment plans, uh, treatment plans are normally redone every four months. IEPs are done at least yearly. Uh, so we have a timeline. We know when we should get to our goal and meet our objective. So what you do is you take an aim line and you take it from the baseline across your graph to where your criteria is. So you'll have this diagonal line going across your graph. I would write this in pencil. pencil. These are very flexible. This is just to guide you and make sure you're on the right track. Because if you're not following that aim line, if the data isn't around that aim line, you're not going to meet your objective in the time that you hope to meet it. So if we look at this slide here, aim lines allow you to compare the actual data with the desired goal. So where are we at? Are we actually moving towards our goal in the timeline we want to? And aim lines are always an estimate. But these can really help with being realistic about your treatment planning and when to change procedures. So if I have a child that is way below my aim, you know, that kind of red flags me and lets me know that you know, maybe I aim too high. Maybe this is too much for this child to attain in such a short period of time. Or it tells me that I need to change the intervention because we're not going to make it and we need to meet these objectives in this time frame. All right, so here's an example. And you see the objective is measured in percentages. I have my baseline and my intervention. Between baseline and intervention, I have a phase change line. And I have the aim line in red. So over my baseline, my average is about 70%. So that's where I'm starting my aim line. And my goal for the objective, according to this, is about 85% over six weeks. And you can see that and by week six, we met the criteria. So as I'm going through, I can see you know, week two. If you look down at the bottom, there's base 1, base 2, base 3, and then week 1 through week 6. So I put my aim line up before I put my data on, and then week 1, I put my data point on. It's a little below the aim. Week 2, my data point is just above the aim. Week 3 and week 4, my data path is following the aim, so I'm doing good. Week five, we dip down a little bit, but week six, we meet our objective criteria. This is why an aim is really important, and it helps make sure you are on the correct track. Now, here is a summary of database decisions by Woolery in 1988. And I love this chart. I would recommend printing this chart out. It gives you an example of the data pattern, the interpretation, and a suggested decision based on the data. So with the first one, the corrects are improving, errors are flat or decreasing. That tells us the program's working. Continue. Life is good. Now when we see progress stalled at about that 20 to 50% correct, that's telling us 
the student can do some of the skill, but not all. There's something that's a little bit of a roadblock here. So we need to take a step back, and we may need to do a task analysis of the skill or shape it a little bit better, uh, manipulate the antecedents a little more. But we need to look at this when we seem to be stalled at that 20 to 50 percent. If our corrects are low or near zero, but we have a high error rate, stop. The task is too difficult. You have not taught the prerequisite skills. Go back and teach them. And here's a fun one. When the correct rate is highly variable or drops sharply, this may be a compliance problem. And if that's the case, then you need to implement a compliance management program. So you need to deal with the compliance problem. Now, when you have the corrects stalled at 80, which for those of us that have done in-home, uh, often the mastery criteria is 80%. And then we move on to another skill. But according to this, if we've reached that 80%, we're not done. We need to see if the child is going to continue to improve and increase their rate or if they're going to stall out at that 80%. And if they do hang and bounce around that 80%, that's showing us that the student has the skill. They're just not fluent in the skill. So at this point, the student is ready for fluency. And I know some of you watching this have worked on terminology cards and just getting your accuracy up to an 80 percent, untimed, very relaxed. Once you're at this 80 percent, you're ready for fluency. So at this point, you increase fluency and add some practice time. Now if you towards the end realize you're at the aim for accuracy and rate, you have had a successful instructional program. And now you're ready to work on some maintenance, go on to generalization, and move on to new tasks. So you've done well. Here's some analysis cliff notes. And for your projects, these are what I really want you to focus on. In general, rules of thumb, if your data points, if you have three consecutive data points below the aim, you need to troubleshoot. You need to possibly change your intervention. If you have three or more data points, consecutive data points above the aim, you may have set your aim too low. So you can just, since you wrote your aim in pencil, you can just readjust it. And if your data points are right along the aim line, maybe one above, one below, two above, two below, you know, you're doing well. Just continue with the intervention. So as you're looking at your graphs for your presentations, I'm really going to look at the aim line. And if you have three or more consecutive points below the aim, we should see a phase change and an intervention change because that's telling us the intervention is not working. If you have some data points, three or more data, consecutive data points above the aim, you may have undershot yourself. You may be able to go higher. And as long as you're right along the aim, you're doing good. When you're graphing data, you want to be able to review it daily. Remember, this is for you. This is for implementation changes. This is for staff training. And what you're looking for is the level. Has the level changed? Is there a difference in the trend? Is there a lot of variability? And where are you around the aim line? This is at the heart of what we do. 
This is the analysis component of ABA. I have a couple alternative decision rules, and these are mainly for acquisition programs, so very new skills uh, that you might see in an in-home intensive program. So if you're remaining on the AIM line for two weeks, you're fine. As always, if you're on the AIM, you're fine. If you're below the AIM by 25% for two weeks, you need a phase change and make an intervention change. So this is another option for analyzing data. So when you're running into some problems and the data is just not going the way you want, uh, you're not quite sure what's going on, these are some things you need to look at. With the intervention, is it being done correctly, consistently, often enough? Is the data accurate? Do you have reliability? Is there enough time during the session to actually run the intervention? Are the intervention procedures clearly stated? And that goes along with, is the intervention being done correctly? And are the staff who are implementing these interventions able to adjust the prompt levels and reinforcement levels on a moment-to-moment -moment basis? If they're not skilled in that, you may have some heavy prompting going on and not enough reinforcing. How do we know? And what do we do? Where do we go if a child's not making progress? This must be decided by looking at the graph. Apply the decision rules. You draw the phase line so that everyone knows that you've changed things up. Sometimes those intervention changes may just be minor updates to the intervention or adjustments. It doesn't mean necessarily if you have a phase change line that you're doing a completely different intervention. You might just be adding another component or cleaning it up. That's okay. And you want to make sure your graph is labeled so we know what baseline is, intervention one, intervention two, and then you need to make sure somewhere else they are described. All right, so there's some baseline and my aim, and I think I have more data points coming up. So first of all, I want you to think about that baseline. Is it stable? Oh, I think all my data points are going to come up independently. All right, I think that's all of them. Looking at the data and its relationship to the aim line, where would you put a phase change line? Looking at the data before and after the phase change line, would you say that the intervention was effective? And just eyeballing this, what do you think the overall trend is? Okay, so there's my aim line again. There's my phase line one. Oops, let me get my data. One, two, three data points below the aim. At this point, I recognize there's a problem and I put in a phase change line. All right, now we're already looking a little better. Got points above. Uh-oh, I've got two points below. I might need to change my intervention again. 
Ah, but luckily I don't. And all is right with the world. Here, let me get all the data points on here. Whoops. There. Okay. So, let's say these first three data points, sorry, are my baseline. Do I need an intervention? I probably shouldn't have even conducted an intervention because my data is increasing. But the intervent the phase line would have come right here after day three. And then we have intervention and then we're looking down here. Now we're three data points below the aim. Now I do need an intervention at this point. But technically I could have waited to this point to implement an intervention.